Hello, my name is Lina Andriolo and I'm the president of the International Youth Nuclear Congress. Clean energy is a key pillar of our sustainable future and its impact is felt both globally and locally. Let's hear from youth how nuclear, in combination with renewables, plays a pivotal role in uplifting communities around the globe and what their aspirations are for a cleaner energy future. I became a nuclear engineer because I care about the environment. And I also care about people across the world having access to abundant energy because energy is the key for opportunity. Policymakers need to understand that we are facing one of the biggest challenges in human history. In the years to come, we will need to change the way we do almost everything. The clean energy transition has become an urgent priority to alleviate and limit the severe economic, social and the environmental impacts of climate change. The reliability I mentioned means nuclear is a great partner for wind and solar. Nuclear and renewables can work together towards net zero emissions. In fact, they already did for the last 30 years in Spain, providing a safe source of energy and creating a clean and healthy environment for all. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, near two nuclear power plants. And because we're powered by nuclear, we don't have the air pollution concerns that you would otherwise have if you lived near fossil fuel plants. As a young generation, we are committed through our association to promote and raise awareness among youth about uh, clean energy transition and how it could preserve our ecosystems. We're also making sure that we're providing opportunities to disadvantaged and underserved communities. New nuclear is a great opportunity to bring clean energy and high paying jobs to those disadvantaged communities. And nuclear, nuclear technology is a key aspect to achieve net zero and to continue towards a sustained development for future generations. I am Katie Huff, Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy in the Department of Energy. And on, the be on behalf of the United States, um, hosts of this forum, it is really my honor to welcome you to Pittsburgh, uh, City of Steel. It's a fitting venue for this forum. And uh, that's why I'm so excited that we'll have the great privilege to hear in particular from a local leader, Connor Lamb, representative to the United States Congress. Uh, today we'll also be addressing several key questions. How do we harness nuclear innovations, lift up communities around the world? Uh, how can we nuclear innovation bring rapid solutions to the twin climate change and ener energy security challenges that we now face? How can we advance social equity and economic empowerment, not only at the national levels, but also for people in local communities worldwide every day? We'll hear from ministers from three countries that are exploring these transitions. Uh, we're honored that Minister of Energy Herman Halashenko could join us today from Ukraine to share his thoughts, not only on the crisis in Ukraine, uh, it's, you know, but also perspectives on global energy security. He'll be in the second panel, which was originally intended to be the first. Um, envisioning a brighter future for Ukraine, it's not too soon to think about rebuilding this country with clean, secure energy post-war. And we'll also hear from uh, Polish and Romanian ministers uh, today. Uh, we'll hear today with multi-government, large national research, research organizations, academia, and environmental advocacy groups. We're going to hear what they're doing to set the stage for global action for rapid and just energy transitions. I'd like to thank the Nuclear Innovation Clean Energy Future Initiative, which we know as Nice Future, for bringing us together for today's event. And I appreciate Nice Future's important work in advancing cooperation on clean nuclear energy systems and design. I'm really excited to announce the launch of Nice Future's new RISE 3 campaign here in Pittsburgh. RISE 3 stands for the campaign to research the impacts on social equity and economic empowerment. This campaign will demonstrate how nuclear innovation can lift up communities every day and around the world. It's led by the United States, Canada, Japan, and the United Kingdom. 
It's joined by Brazil and Kenya and multi-governmental and other organizations. RISE 3 is going to provide expert resources and create a blueprint for countries transitioning to a clean and just energy economy with nuclear energy as a key pillar. RISE 3 will recommend areas where nuclear technologies can advance environmental justice and equity. And the campaign will support and track community transformations with a focus on how unabated coal site conversion options with nuclear and renewables uh, will enable economic impacts and jobs. Uh, RISE 3 will also feature advances in design that um, can expand nuclear renewables integration, flexible energy grids, thermal and electrical engineer energy, process heat utilization, desalination, hydrogen, and more. Um, speaking of hydrogen, uh, be sure to check out uh, the, this year's great hydrogen report from this program. Uh, RISE 3 is developing an important model study on nuclear renewables integration and job creation with Kenya. Uh, we've also launched a wonderful new RISE 3D case series on transitioning communities. There are some posters in the back of the room that you can check out. Uh, we're going to build through that on the technical work of the three-year Nice Future Flexible Nuclear Campaign for Nuclear Renewables Integration, also known as FNC. FNC illustrated how innovative nuclear can be operated flexibly in tandem with renewables and maximize a wide range of societally beneficial electric and non-electric applications. Nice Future was designed to ensure prominent consideration of nuclear innovation in holistic clean energy planning. And nuclear accounts for about one third of the world's zero emission electricity production. So the Biden administration is all in on nuclear energy. And uh, nuclear is going to be an important part of our actions, including historic innovations and investments here today. So let's join together to ensure that nuclear innovation can help us accelerate on our path to net zero and a more secure energy world. I'm really eager to learn the results of today's discussions. Thank you, and I'm excited to introduce none other than Kirsty Gogan from Terra Praxis, who will be leading this incredible panel of experts next to me, which is the first of two, uh, but reordered. Thank you. so much, Dr. Huff. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to be invited to moderate this very distinguished panel. So uh, my name is Kirsty Gogan from Terra Praxis. Um, and on the panel today, we have John Wagner, who's the director of the Idaho National Lab and president of Battelle Energy Alliance. We have Maria Korsnick, president and chief um, executive officer of the Nuclear Energy Institute, of course, the nuclear, the nuclear industry's policy organization based in DC. Always love having Maria on a panel, so that's very exciting. Congressman Connor Lamb, um, who was sworn into the uh, US House of Representatives in January 2021, so congratulations on that. But also, wow, what a city. It's wonderful to be here in Pittsburgh. And then, of course, we have uh, William Magwood, who's the Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency since 2014. Great to see you here, Bill. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And Todd Allen, who's a professor at the University of Michigan and a senior fellow at Third Way. Now, um, I'd like to kick things off just by sort of calling your attention to the title of this panel, you know, Action and Acceleration, because as we all know, nuclear energy is already contributing, you know, an incredible um, service to our environmental and social and economic well-being globally around the world. But we've never seen such demand as we see today for clean energy, for all of the reasons that we understand the the economic imperatives coming out of the, the very tough pandemic over the past two years, and then most recently, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we need to um, accelerate uh, the provision of nuclear energy to meet these these uh, these drivers around um, economic well-being, affordability, um, and then, of course, um, energy security, but also decarbonization. And nuclear energy can hit all three of those imp incredibly important points. So here at this panel, you know, we'd like to discuss ways forward in which you know, we can help really accelerate these energy transformations with nuclear innovation for social equity, for economic empowerment. So addressing these innovative technologies with integrated clean energy system concepts that can be deployed this decade. Okay, so this is not like far out. We wanna hear action opportunities to really deploy in the near term, in the medium term, um, and expand that existing capacity of both large and small reactors 
So I'd like to hear from the panelists today about what you see as being the primary challenges and opportunities um, that you can share with our with our guests today. So um, let's get let's kick things off. So I'd love to turn first of all to Maria. Now we've just heard about what governments can do to accelerate uh, nuclear deployment, and I notice, of course, that in some cases coal sites are looking to repower to clean energy, and they're considering nuclear energy. In fact, we're seeing states all over the United States overturning historic moratoria on nuclear energy because there's such a demand from the political and public uh, communities for this opportunity to repower their plants. What can the industry do to accelerate that transition with the new generation of advanced technologies? And how soon will we see that innovation being deployed to support everyday lives of communities around the world? Maria, please. Well, thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thanks for um, moderating this panel. Wow. Uh, I've been in the nuclear industry for 35 years, and uh, there has never been a time like we are experiencing right now uh, in nuclear energy. So it's a very exciting and thriving time uh, for, for nuclear. And, and what I mean by that is thanks to our national labs and a lot of work that they've done over many years and now partnering with the private sector, the innovation pipeline is chock full of ideas and demonstrations that are sort of ready to come out. And that's what you're going to see happen over the next five, seven, ten years. Um, are these designs getting licensed and getting built? Um, and so uh, very, very exciting. And, and her question is, you know, sort of, and what can we do uh, to encourage that? And one of the things, uh, obviously, that we need to do is working with the states to really appreciate the value that nuclear will bring, the value in jobs, the value in clean energy, the value in, in no air pollution. Um, so there's a lot of a health value there. Um, so there's a lot that really can occur in a very positive way, and we need to get that message out. There are many, many activities at the state level that are happening. When you start getting into deployment, um, it really becomes sort of a state uh, level conversation because that's where you're going to get your permits. That's where you're going to actually, uh, you know, have the build. So I, I think an even stronger partnership at the state level is something uh, that can be focused on in the near term. I would say the other thing we can do from an industry perspective is go forward now with site permits. Uh, she mentioned the fact that there are coal plants that are scheduled to close. Hundreds of coal plants in the United States will be scheduled to close over the next decade. And that is a great opportunity uh, to take a look for nuclear because not only can you replace that generation, you can reuse that infrastructure, right? Those high lines, those transmission lines, and you can also um, provide the jobs uh, to, that, to that local economy. If I would just kind of leave you with a, a thought of sort of how things are changing, um, you know, in uh, Wyoming, they actually had four different areas compete as to which one would get the nuclear plant, okay? That's not what we're used to, right? Nuclear is not used to being popular, right? We're not used to being fought over in a good way. Um, but those are the kinds of things that you're hearing about now, right? Because people are getting it. They're understanding the value of that clean energy. They're understanding the value of those jobs. And um, you know, it's not, it's not an either or. We should have a wonderful relationship with renewables and with batteries. It's sort of a together thing is going to make the best solution. And so that's also, I think, the message that needs to get out. Let's make sure that we're building the right technology in the right place and together offering consumers uh, the, the best price. Um, I would offer just one, one final thought, um, and that is we recently did a study with Vibrant Clean Energy to study um, the, you know, sort of the value to the consumer. And they did a, let's pick as much nuclear as we could with the model, and then they did a constrained case where they didn't allow the model to select nuclear even though it wanted to select it. Um, and we're saying, well, that could be slow because of supply chain or it could be slow because of regulatory issues. We didn't give it a reason, we just said, you know, didn't allow it to select. Um, and so it had a reduced role for nuclear. And so between now and 2050, and we analyzed the difference in the cases, that reduced role for nuclear cost consumers over $400 billion in this time frame. So when we don't allow nuclear to be deployed and we rely too heavily on intermittent resources, it's much more expensive for the consumer. 
And if we're gonna decarbonize, we must do it affordably. And that's where nuclear having a role, an appropriate role, is a winning solution. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yeah, um, wonderful point. So, um, Congressman Lamb, we're so honored to have you here um, representing the, um, the global uh, energy, of this global clean energy event. I feel like something's happening. Do you, do you want me to? Oh, sure. So, excuse me just for one moment. Sorry. We have an announcement, I think. My apologies to our speakers in this session. Uh, because we flipped the panels, um, the minister from Ukraine, um, who was on our first session, his schedule got thrown a little bit. And so in deference and respect for him and his time, um, I would like to have him come up quickly since he did join us. Um, and since a lot of our conversation is about the situation in Ukraine and energy security and the importance of that, sir, I please give you the floor so that you can make comments at the podium. And I appreciate your joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the <laughs> SMS. But um, uh, thank you. That's, we, we already had a uh, discussion about nuclear, and, and that, is, that is very important uh, uh, to understand uh, what has ha happened uh, with the war. Uh, Ukraine is uh, uh, at uh, four, five, in fact, five nuclear, nuclear stations. Uh, one is well-known Chernobyl, which is not operational now. And for uh, another station, so we had 15 units, and uh, nuclear uh, um, generation in Ukraine provided up to 60% of all electricity of the country. So that's very important for us uh, issue. But uh, with the war, uh, in fact, the war started with the, uh, the, the first hours, the Russia occupied the Chernobyl uh, NPP, and uh, I, I was there the next day. It was the 2nd of April when they, they uh, already leave the station. Uh, and I said uh, to, to our national regulator that uh, he was really, you know, he, was, he, he couldn't understand what they are doing there because they destroyed everything they can. I mean, uh, it, it was like uh, the task to destroy what you can uh, just to reach. And this feeling was really, you know, that uh, when uh, soldiers uh, uh, destroyed uh, just because they're supposed to destroy. I mean, uh, and that is not a war. That is not the rules of the war, what they did. And that what's happened with Zaporizhia now. So unfortunately, that's, it's still occupied. I hope this uh, not for long, uh, but uh, what we see, they don't care about nuclear safety. They don't care about security. And that is the most dangerous situation we could even think on. Because we, we never had this situation before when, uh, when they captured the Zaporizhia, it was night from uh, uh, 3rd to 4th of March. So they uh, use tanks, they use heavy artillery. So there is a video from the cameras how they did it, and so they shell the, st shell the station. And uh, frankly speaking, I cannot imagine it's possible just to shell the nuclear station. And, uh, but they did it. Uh, just several days ago, they shell the South Ukrainian station, which is under Ukrainian control. And that is some, some incredible things which, 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 which has happened. And we understand that today we should think on some, some new construction of nuclear safety in the world. Uh, because it's not, a, not an issue for Ukraine, only for Ukraine. So this issue to Europe, this issue to, to the world. And we, we discuss very strongly this in details with the IA, and we, we, know, uh, we thanks to the missions which they managed to send to the Zaporizhia. But it doesn't change the situation with the shellings. So every day they shell the station. We already had 
at several uh, blackouts of the, of the Parisian PP, which is like one step to the scenario of Fukushima. Sorry, I'm telling this, but that, that is true when the diesel generators was on, on, on operation. And uh, what we need, we try to speak, of course we are speaking about demilitarization, we're speaking about the necessity to return to control, to Ukrainian control, this station. And only Ukraine could provide nuclear security and nuclear safety on this station. Even the recommendation of EIA, which mission shows and which are very, very good and essential recommendation, uh, we, we, we cannot implement because we are not controlling the station. And that is a situation which uh, shows that we need to think about some new modalities in, in, uh, in, on this issue. This is modalities which was not before, it was not after the World War II. Uh, I have one just interesting story with, with the Russians when we went to Chernobyl and MPP and we see that they really dig in the forest which is influenced by the radiation, Re really heavy influence. I can't believe that it is true, but I saw it personally. Uh, and uh, it was some uh, journalists from CNN, and I make an interview there, I said, look, well, they dig, and we see that uh, the level of radiation is really very high. Uh, and he asked me what would happen with the soldiers. I said, so they, they would be influenced by the radiation, and that would influence their health. And the next day, some Russian general probably saw my interview and somebody told him and he was asked, does some Ukrainian minister said that it would influence the people, the radiation, why are you doing this, this is the Russian soldiers? They said, no, he's an idiot. Because we digging this forest in 1941, it was a line of protection. Nobody was influenced by radiation. And that's why I'm, of course it's a funny story, but why I'm talking this. That is the level of understanding of these soldiers who shell the station. What is this about? What about radiation? What about the risks? What about nuclear station? That's, that shows the level of their understanding. And uh, I think that very important that all together, I mean all civilized world, should answer to this, to this action. We, we cannot just allow them to repeat and repeat and repeat. And, and that is very dangerous game because the shelling Every day, the lines. So we already uh, we, we're trying to repair these lines as, as quickly as we can, at least to provide electricity for own use. But they shell these lines again and again and again. And uh, I think that we should uh, raise the issue of uh, uh, what to do with this. I mean, to to make some decision and quick decision, because otherwise that's uh, um, that's a risk for everyone. So, and this quick de decision should be implemented. I mean, uh, I don't have the concrete uh, answers to this question, but I think that's very important to discuss, very important to discuss that's publicly, openly, that the Russians should, should, should listen to this discussion. And we should say to them, guys, that if you would do this, then we would do that. And that should be done as quickly as we can. And that's... Uh, Thanks to these events, we, we really we, we had a chance to discuss this the detail, in detail with uh, Jenny von Granholt, with today with Grossi. So we discuss uh, any possible formats of, of what the civilized world should answer to this craziness, what, what they are doing. So I hope that, uh, so we are fighting, we will win this war, and that's for sure. But the question of nuclear safety and security, uh, we, should, we should settle right now, not to wait for tomorrow and, or day after tomorrow. So that's very important to settle it right now immediately, not to wait until uh, we, we, will, we will win this war. And, and that, that is very important. Thank you. So we will resume our regular program. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister, for stopping by to see us. Um, those who are standing in the back, feel free to have a seat.
Um, and the thing that happens when you bring the juggernauts out of their fields is that we've got to juggle schedules. And so my moderator, Madam Kirsty Gogan, will have to depart um, to get to another event. So she's going to finish up her first round of questions. I'm going to invite anyone on the stage who does not have to leave at, at a certain time to stay with me, and I'm going to call up my two speakers who remain, and we're going to have a bigger panel and bigger discussion. Um, and thank you all so much um, for, for accommodating all of this, uh, all of this moving around. Um, but personally, I'm so glad that I was able to be here to, to hear that speech um, from, from the Ukrainian minister. It was, it was a really real honor. Um, so I, I'll return now to, to our session. And I think, you know, with, with added emphasis, really, on the need for, for early action and acceleration um, to really respond to the need for um, a lot more um, resilient, clean, affordable, clean energy. And um, Congressman Lamb, um, you know, I mentioned that we're so happy to be here in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh, you know, it's is on the global stage. And I'd love you to share with us some of your insights um, from from your city's experience in achieving really successful. Uh, energy transitions and what lessons we could take to the global to the global stage. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate all of you who came from out of town. Uh, thank you for coming to visit us. Uh, the story of Pittsburgh is very important, I think, for what all of us are trying to do here. And what you're seeing here at the convention center and in the downtown area, and if you happen to have visited Carnegie Mellon before, uh, that's the good side of the story. That These are the areas of our city where this sort of eds and meds economic model uh, has succeeded where entrepreneurs are starting new businesses um, in the tech space and the clean energy space. The areas that I represent in Congress are all outside of the city of Pittsburgh. They're suburban and rural up to the Ohio line. Um, it includes the area where the first civilian nuclear reactor was at shipping port. It includes a lot of areas where they drill for natural gas and have run on coal and all that sort of thing. Um, Pittsburgh has not quote unquote transitioned quite as well in those areas, similar to how it has happened all over the Rust Belt. Some of the more industrial areas uh, haven't gotten the same level of investment. But the people who live there are ferociously loyal to the towns that they come from and they want to stay and they want there to be middle class jobs in their town in the future too. And that's where I think nuclear energy can play such an important role, already has played an important role in this community for almost 70 years. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm mystified by uh, the discussion that we have around how are we going to create jobs in the clean energy sector in the future when we have to decarbonize. And I just think to myself, like, we already have those jobs. And they are already union jobs. I mean, in, in most of our state, at least, it's not the same everywhere, but in most of our state, the workers at all these power plants are represented by the IBEW um, at Beaver Valley Power Station in, in my district. Many, many of the workers are veterans of the United States Navy, so you've got veteran union members making a good wage for their family in an area of 15 or 20 miles outside of a big city. Uh, there really are not very many industries in America that can say that at this point, and I don't think there are any other that are actually contributing to the fight against climate change that can say that. So that is sort of one of the reasons I've tried to become a real advocate for nuclear energy and for these workers and their families is it's just a successful model that has withstood so much industrial change in our region. Interestingly, at the, at the same place that that nuclear plant is in my district now, uh, there's a coal-fired power plant right next to it. Uh, and it's kind of illustrative if, if you hear people talk about coal to nuclear now and why that makes so much sense. If you weren't in the nuclear energy industry and didn't really know what you were talking about and you drove past these two plants, pretty sh certain you would not be able to tell which one was which. I mean, they look very, very similar to each other unless you really, really know what you're looking for. And um, that coal-fired power plant closed two years ago uh, under the previous administration. And the real reason is because it was undercut by the low prices of natural gas around here. But I think if we had a successful policy in this country, uh, the day that that plant was ready to close, we would have been preparing it uh, to become a nuclear power plant. And that has not happened. Uh, it's just basically sitting there vacant. There was another thousand union jobs there that all went away. Uh, and it was a tremendous loss to that community. And so that's what I think of as the goal of the policies that we're trying to implement is how can we take 
these sites that really are, are the economic generators of the town that they sit in. I mean, this power plant and the coal-fired power plants around here are the centers of the town where they live, the biggest employers. They, they fund everything. Um, how can we make that switch in a reasonable period of time? Thankfully, uh, this administration has prioritized uh, industrial communities, specifically coal communities, unlike we could have ever imagined. We're very, very grateful for it. Um, and in the Inflation Reduction Act that we just passed, not only are we um, prioritizing clean energy production and finally including nuclear within the definition of clean energy that's eligible for these tax credits, there's even another tax credit on top of that for locating your facility in a in a coal community as they define it. And so that plant that I was talking about that used to be a coal power plant, you'd get double bang for your buck on the tax credits if you put a nuclear uh, facility there. So for any entrepreneurs or business people in the room who are looking for a fantastic opportunity, just drive up the Ohio River. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And maybe in a few years, uh, we could be celebrating another couple thousand jobs in this region. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> So, so inspiring and so, so on the money, you know, this is really about, you know, about the clean energy transition from a climate perspective and an energy security perspective, but it's also really about the people, really about the people and the communities and the jobs. And if we can have all of those things combined, then that's what success looks like. So that's just fantastic. Thank you. Um, PG Magwood, I'd love to turn to you now. And, you know, of course, your agency is working with member countries all over the world that are really interested in... Uh, build, building up their um, uh, their energy infrastructure and including nuclear energy. And I'd love to hear from you about your thoughts on how we can really help accelerate that access to many countries. Well, I think, thank you very much. There we go. Thank you very much, Kirsty. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. A lot of very familiar faces, uh, people I've worked with and, and interact with for, for many years. And... Um, it's good to be having this conversation at this point in history. Um, first, I'll, I, as I'm probably going to say every time I speak at this conference, I am from Pittsburgh. I am a native <laughs> Pittsburgher. Um, and I, I do come back quite frequently, so it's not like I haven't been here in a while. But um, I think this is one of the, one of the maybe a handful of times I've, I've been back to Pittsburgh for, um, for a major event. Now, for people in Pittsburgh, this event probably isn't as visible as more important events have taken place in the in this convention center, like the furries. When the furries come, that is huge. People are so excited when they see those people walk around, look like big mice and and cats and rabbits and all those sorts of things. Right? That's the that's the big event. Here. Maybe we should invite a few of them to we the next the nuclear conference. Yeah. Um, you know, and I I often I, I appreciate the congressman's um, quick snapshot about how Pittsburgh is really the, the birth cradle of U.S. commercial nuclear energy. A lot, a lot of people, um, even in the business, don't really remember that, but it's true. This is where it really started. It started uh, with the work on a Nautilus. Uh, of course, you know, Rita's here, so she can, yeah, Nautilus, right. <laughs> um, and then, uh, which evolved in the shipping port and really launched the U.S. commercial nuclear energy business. And uh, when people often ask me, how did I get into this whole nuclear thing, uh, when I was in high school, it was a pretty natural thing to do, quite frankly. You know, that was that was a big thing around Pittsburgh, you know, the nuclear business. And so it wasn't, it was almost hard not to get into the nuclear business at, at, in those days. Um, and certainly when I was, um, as I was just telling the congressman, when I was in, what, ninth or 10th grade, and I went to um, Westinghouse's Science Honors Institute, which was for high school students. It was really for seniors, but I was a little precocious at the time. Um, you know, and I got these lectures about, about nuclear. Um, and I remember I, I went to one of the lecturers who was talking about nuclear. And, and I was talking about nuclear. I, I, I asked him a question. I can't remember exactly what my question was, but what part of his answer was that really you can think of nuclear as just being another way of boiling water. And that always stuck with me because it's true, <laughs> you know, and it really boils it down, so to speak, um, to the essence, which is that nuclear is a way of making electricity. That's what it's all about. You know, it's not a religion. It's not, um, it's not a philosophy. It's a way of making electric power um, for society, to make society work, to be, enable people to, um, to build um, their lives and build their economies and achieve their ambitions. And so at the end of the day, 
what we always have to remember is that we are here to talk about a way of making a product that people need, which is electricity. And electricity is increasingly becoming clearer as being the separator between societies that are successful and societies that are not successful. If your society have, has access to electricity that's reliable, that's secure, that's cost effective, you're going to do better than societies that do not have those. Um, and in my view, this is where nuclear becomes very important because nuclear is a way of making electricity that once in place, of course that is the hard part for us, and I'll get back to that in a moment, that once in place provides the most secure, most reliable, uh, cost-effective source of electricity that you can get anywhere. And in OECD countries remains to this day the largest source of non-emitting electricity um, that there is. Um, and around the world is second only to hydro. So it is true that people don't recognize that. They, uh, if you poll most people in the public, I'm sure they would say it's wind or solar or something like that. But you know, it's, it's, it is going to be an education program. And part of what I think we have to do is to explain to the broader community that, again, nuclear is a way of make, making electricity, but it's a way that makes the others work better. Um, if you want to see a large deployment of renewables, if you want to see carbon emissions reduced, um, you're going to need something that makes everything work better. You need to have a, a way of stabilizing the electricity system to make sure that it's reliable, that you don't have shortfalls, you don't have brownouts, and the way to do that is to have something that is entirely reliable and dispatchable, and nuclear fits that role. And among reliable dispatchable sources, nuclear is the only one that is not emitting uh, outside of hydro. So that, that is a big part of the story. But we do have some challenges. And one, and, and for really answering Kersey's question, I think one challenge that we have is to recognize um, two things. First, we still to this day do not have the right policies in our countries to make nuclear succeed. Um, not because I'm talking about making the regulation easier or permitting easier or anything like that. It's simply the economic model of the way we buy electricity um, does not achieve the goals that we say that we have heard, you know, Secretary Kerry, we heard Fadi Bureau, we heard everyone talk about how important it is to, to reduce CO2 emissions, to deal with the climate crisis. Our electricity systems in all of our countries fail to enable us to do that. Um, and this has been true for years, it is still true, and I'm willing to bet it'll be true next year because people have not accepted the need um, to price carbon, which is essential, and to reflect the values that we say we have in the way that we charge and, and use electricity. Secondly, and I'm gonna put the, the emphasis on the industry. Um, the industry has not proven its ability to deploy nuclear plants on a cost and on a schedule. Um, there have been many projects, we don't have to go over them here today, that have simply not succeeded um, in that respect. Um, they have been far over their cost, far over their, their schedule, and if we're going to be successful going forward, we can't have this go on again. We have to be able to, uh, to implement these projects successfully, have supply chains that work, and have the ability to be to have nuclear plants built um, as products without the drama that we have seen in the recent in the recent decades. So those two things: government policies to price electricity appropriately, industry prepared to implement projects correctly. Um, those are going to be the tails of the tape at the end of the day. Um, and I, I will say that the work that governments are doing to demonstrate new nuclear technologies is absolutely essential. Uh, we can't expect the private sector to do first of a kind every time, but once that first of a kind is done, we have people to implement. So th I think that's what I would focus on. Thank you so much. Um, I love that, uh, you know, the kind of boiling it down, you know, as a Brit, obviously we love boiling water to make tea. And, you know, I think actually the amazing thing about nuclear energy is that it is incredibly versatile. It's obviously um, a great way to make electricity, but there's so many other things that we can also do with that technology because it makes heat and power and the application of that technology for a broad range of our decarbonization and, uh, and energy security needs um, is, is absolutely critical. Um, and so I'm going to turn to Dr. Wagner now, who's leading, you know, at the leading edge 
of developing and researching these kinds of very broad, very diverse applications for nuclear technology. I'd love to hear from you about, um, about some of those initiatives that, that you're leading through, the, through INL, um, especially to support you know, those objectives that uh, Dr. Huff outlined in the Nice Future Initiative and now the new RISE 3 initiative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So first of all, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, and uh, appreciate the remarks from the Ukrainian minister, too. It's incredible uh, in a very terrible way what's happening over there. So I want to acknowledge that and whatever support I could provide. Um, turning to the question, though, um, so at the Idaho National Laboratory, we're the nation's center for nuclear energy research, development, and demonstration. And I want to start kind of high level and then, and then come down to your question. Uh, so our vision at the laboratory is to change the world's energy future and secure our critical infrastructure. And in that statement, the world is really quite intentional because as we look to develop technological solutions, we need solutions that are not just um, enabling the U.S. to decarbonize, that's not enough. We need solutions that will enable the world to decarbonize. They need to be viable, they need to be equitable, they need to be economical is, is some of the things, and they need to be deployable. Uh, so we, we look at that in, in, in everything that we do. So what do we do? Um, so a lot of our work, uh, particularly in the last few years, and by the way, I want to I wanna comment on Maria's comment. Uh, she said she's been in the business for 35 years, never seen anything like it is today. Uh, I haven't been in the business quite that long, but I want to echo that, that sentiment. It's amazing what is happening uh, in, in terms of support for nuclear, financially, stakeholder, uh, and so forth. So we have a huge opportunity. So what do we do at the lab? A lot of our work is focused on enabling the advanced reactors to be demonstrated and deployed, developed, demonstrated, and deployed uh, for the future. Those reactors that will not just replace the current fleet, but also uh, expand the nuclear energy's role in terms of energy production uh, in this country and, and well beyond. And now, we still do a lot of research and technologies to support the safe and, and economical operation of the current reactors, but a big focus is on, on the advanced reactors. We also do a lot of work on technologies on how nuclear integrates with intermittent sources, renewable sources, energy storage, and so forth. And while a lot of remarks were focused on nuclear for electricity, how nuclear can be used for, for applications beyond electricity. Think about industrial process heat, desalination, hydrogen production is a, is a key area as well. A lot of different uh, areas there as well. Then to broaden out the technologies that we work on at the laboratory, it's not enough to have clean energy and have a clean energy transition. It has to be secure. It has to be reliable. It has to be robust. Uh, and so we do a lot of work on infrastructure security, both physical and cyber. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're baking that in as we do the energy transition, that we're actually replacing those systems, those components, creating an energy system that is, is secure. Then lastly, since I have the mic and I know we're behind, I'll just note what I would like people to know in terms of technologies, uh, in the technology space, what's going on in nuclear, is that there is a lot happening. There is a whole lot happening in terms of advanced reactor demonstrations that a lot of people don't necessarily see. Uh, there's a whole lot of work in very small systems. We intend to take a system critical on our site in 2023, uh, at the latest very early 2024, another one in 2024, another one in 2025. These are small systems that will be DOE authorized as we learn how to do this again and, 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 and work not only to demonstrate the technologies, develop the technologies, but to provide confidence that those bigger systems can be deployed and can make a difference uh, in the time frames that matter. So there's a whole lot happening, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll yield time at this point. Thank you. Thank you, John. And see how seamlessly I just slide in for Kirsty Gogan? Um, so for those of you who were late coming into the room, uh, we flipped our sessions around, and we also had the Minister of Ukraine come in uh, due to his schedule. So trust me, this is not panel number two. But what I am going to do for the sake of time is call up Adam Giborgé-Jertovinsky, the Under Secretary of State and Minister of Climate and Environment, to make remarks from the podium and to answer my question about Poland's current deployment of large reactors um, and the effect of the war in Ukraine on the acceleration of that timeline. 
as well as what we can do regionally and globally to support that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> so uh, how, how do we plan to accelerate uh, our nuclear program? I think there was a, a comment that was made just a minute ago by Mr. Macwood that it's uh, uh, it's hard to find a, prog a program that was actually delivered on time, yet along accelerated. Um, but we but we do have some some ideas of what what we could do. What what and let me first start maybe with what the the war um, in Ukraine has on how it has impacted our um, energy policy in Poland. We. Uh, we had an energy policy that was adopted uh, just uh, two years ago, actually. Um, and then uh, comes a war that indeed reshuffles a lot of uh, functioning of the market, access to energy sources, and a lot of assumptions that were underlying um, the transition that we were planning. The biggest one is certainly the role of gas in that transition, which although in our uh, uh, transition was actually fairly limited compared to others of our, on, uh, of our neighbors, still was increased compared to the current levels that we have. So we started thinking, what can we do to get rid, basically, of gas in that transition as much as we could, actually, and <clears throat> at least. The one obvious um, uh, answer is to accelerate the development of renewables, which can be done in, um, in a po probably a bit shorter time frame than the development of nuclear, but also we want to accelerate the development of nuclear. And there, there are mainly two things that we, we are considering. One is um, we are planning two sites for large uh, reactors in, in Poland, and we were planning to start the works on the second site um, only um, when we start building on the first site. So one thing that we could do is start they did design preparatory works, identification first of the, the second site uh, earlier, and accelerate, therefore, uh, the development of, of uh, these reactors on these sites. And then the second development we've seen in the last couple of years in Poland, as in many other countries, is a huge interest of um, the industry in SMRs. And this is something that wasn't factored in our initial energy policy. And so maybe this is not something that precisely will accelerate the development of nuclear, but it will accelerate certainly the decarbonization of our energy mix and of our, our economy. Um, the, the time horizon we're, we're looking at is also uh, uh, similar with the development of our, um, of our own uh, uh, program for large-scale uh, reactors, but this is something that could allow us to include more stable zero emission sources in our energy system uh, sooner than we anticipated. The biggest challenge we have in, in, in Poland from that perspective is the fact that our uh, coal power plants are coming um, to an end of their lifetime. Basically, 70% of them are more than 30 years old. So we expect to close most of them in the 30s. So that's why. For us, it was critical to uh, start a program uh, with um, a technology that is proven, safe. It's a design that was verified and already built in, a, in several locations. That's why we went for a third generation's uh, reactor. And, uh, and we will continue to develop uh, uh, that program and, and possibly even accelerate the, the development of nuclear in Poland. Thank you. Okay, may I please call Anna Virchow, the um, Special Envoy for Strategic and International Affairs in, at Nuclear Electrica in Romania and former Deputy Prime Minister to join me at the stage. See, I was strategic so you wouldn't have to walk across all these folks. So Let please, the yes, please come on up, Anna, and join us on the panel. And behind the door. Yes. Actually, let me get out of the way of Deutsche. Turn 
on in Romania, as well as um, the themes around working with underserved populations, as you've described, Congressman Lamb, that, represent, that you represent in your constituency. Um, so Todd Allen, let me come to you, sir. Um, based on the work in the fastest path to zero um, at the University of Michi Michigan, what are the key lessons that you've learned about how nuclear can advance social and economic empowerment? Yeah, thanks a lot, and for giving me the opportunity to prove to the audience that a professor can talk for less than 50 minutes. That's I'm a time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think in the end, right, the key is you want your relationship with the community that hosts you to be good from, from the time you start engaging with them to the time you, uh, through the entire you know, decades that you operate that plant. Um, and that the benefits that they get feel that they outweigh the risks and they're equitably distributed. Right? And I think we need to think about that from the earliest stages of designing a plant. Right? You can think about ways, before you spend a billion dollars designing the plant, could you make changes that'll make it more likely people want to host your plant? I'll give you a non-nuclear example, airplanes, right? If you were gonna design an airplane as an engineer, you would not put windows in it. It just makes it harder, right? But the people are more likely to wanna to fly on your airplane if you put the windows in, right? So there may be things that you can do early on that make a difference. Then there's a phase that we call transition, right? Where you're starting to communicate with a community, right? You want to build something in their community. Do that early. Right? You are more likely to fail if the first time they hear of you is when you announce that you have bought the land and you're building the plant. Right? Start early, understand community values right? and how you can work with them right? to be good neighbors. And then finally, you will work with them for decades. Right? So have a way to make sure that you are engaging throughout the decades of that partnership to make sure that things are still positive. Right? So from a nuclear engineer standpoint, what might you do? Well, when you start designing the plant, when you round up your neutronics expert and your thermal hydraulics expert and your materials expert, get a community engagement expert, right? Make them part of your design team. As you start to go into the transition phase, right? Think about, are they ready to host your technology, right? We're, as engineers, we're very disciplined about technology readiness levels and we need to work our way up until we're ready to commercial, uh, commercial deployment. My colleague, Aditi Verma, plug for a colleague, just wrote a very nice paper on societal readiness level. She's written something that parallels that. Right? I think we need to be very thoughtful about are people ready to accept our technologies and understand them. Right? In some of the cases we've talked about cold and nuclear transition, you've got energy workers who may be, it may be easier, right? but they may know nothing about nuclear, right? so there are things you need to, to work with those communities. And then finally, on the operation side, as I said, it's an 80-year relationship. Right? And I think we should treat that just like we treat the rest of the aspects of operating our plant successfully. Like We're really good about taking data on a pump and changing the oil on time to make sure that the pump operates forever. We ought to take data on our relationship with the community. Right? We don't want that to go off track, right? because our ability to operate successfully in the community is partly how we operate the plant, but it's partly how welcome we are. Right? So I think there's an end-to-end -end thoughtfulness about community engagement in EJ that we didn't really think about first generation nuclear. But as you've heard from some of the panelists, there are lots of different, very different business deployment strategies, different sized reactors in places we never put them. And I think if we're not thoughtful about how we are welcomed and how we develop those relationships, we won't be as successful. Thank you, Todd. All right, so Anna, over to you. Um, first of all, in your previous capacity as Deputy Prime Minister, that's number two of the country, and now in your current capacity as Special Envoy at Nuclear Electrica, um, you're uniquely positioned because you've worked this issue on both sides. Um, and, and if anyone doesn't know, let's commend you for kicking China out of the project with Romania. Um, I'm not on their Christmas card. <laughs> Um, but, but Romania is looking to expand its nuclear capacity, both uh, with large reactor completion and refurbishment, as well as adding SMRs to that mix. So what do you see as those challenges, and, and what support could like-minded partners uh, give in that process? Well, thank you so much, uh, Alicia, and uh, please uh, allow me firstly to say a huge thank you and congratulations for getting us all together 
Uh, I'm very happy to say that um, um, nuclear is not anymore the bow bow in the room, uh, but there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of the communication to really get out the benefits what uh, nuclear can produce to the communities and can produce to a, a country in terms of the energy security and energy independence. And coming back to your, your question, uh, I'm very proud to say that Romania was among the very few countries in the region, um, along with Poland for that example. For many years back, we understood the threat of using the energy by Putin as a, uh, as a weapon. And unfortunately, we were right, but we were wise many years back. And I have to say a huge thank you to Alicia, because she's been very instrumental and is critically instrumental in our efforts many years back, starting uh, uh, concretely in 2018, when we were opposing Nord Stream 2, uh, Poland and Romania were among the very few countries when 2018 we opposed the Nord Stream 2 and then um, uh, uh, advocated for um, having the US coming to the region, helping us, helping Romania to really not just secure our energy, uh, but through us securing the energy in our region for countries such as uh, Moldova and other countries. And um, for that, there are not words to say a huge thank you because early on we understood uh, that uh, threat. So uh, what um, uh, Romania is doing through nuclear electric, I'm very happy to see that, you know, you see here, we are the first of a kind in partnership with New Scale to actually have the first SMR in Romania, in, in no, in the world. And the first one, this is the first site in Romania and it will, will be more to follow. Uh, so practically we are completing now two more uh, units uh, in terms of the nuclear with the uh, North American technology. And I have to say that uh, we've been uh, the very few country in the region when from very early on, even with unit one and two, even though there were huge pressures from the Russians to really have their technology, we stood firm and we had the North American uh, technology and uh, SNNE Nuclear Electrica, uh, I'm very proud to say that is operating it in a very safe way for more than 25 years of experience at the highest level and that experience and that training we are there uh, for you to share, you know, to, happy to share it with you, take advantage of it and bank on it. So coming back to what we need to do is to continue our efforts. We have an action plan with, uh, with the United States um, and with Canada for the unit uh, the refurbishment of unit uh, one, but completion of unit three and four. And at the same time have the SMRs being deployed, as I said, in Romania, first of a kind. We are building now um, a, a simulator uh, reactor as well in partnership with New Scale that will be used for training. It has been built at the, uh, you know, it's going to be built at the universities. So in other words, what we are saying, look, look for the companies in the room. Look at Central Eastern Europe. There is there a market for you to grab it. And I think the lessons that needs to be drawn is, um, you know, uh, choose your partner wisely. We've been very wise to choose the partner partnership with strategic partnership with the United States. And we are just implementing this action plan. And we, um, uh, you know, we will not just gain that fully independence of energy, but we will be in a unique position to really help the others in our region with the energy security, but likewise with all the training and experience that we are having. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are at 128 already, and so we have a 15 minute transition time. So I'm gonna leverage about seven or eight minutes off of that and ask one final question to all of our panelists and count on those in this room to be um, transition mindful in eight minutes that follows. Um, so I, I can't miss this opportunity. Um, so please, the question um, to all of you and the opportunity if you'd either like to answer the question or give some final thoughts. Um, the question I have is we've talked a lot about the importance of communication and whether we're talking domestically in your city or in a country or globally communication around nuclear, its benefits, and how it impacts people's lives is critically important because we know that while there are many nuclear engineers and many smart people, not everyone has that degree. So they don't understand base load 24-7, all of that. They want to know, is it going to be safe for me and my family? 
Um, is it going to create jobs? All of those types of things. So when you think about communication and supporting communities in that way, um, what are your thoughts on what could be done better or how we're doing? And also please give me um, your final thought phrased as an action step as to what concrete step um, a government could take in the next year to move this conversation forward and support the people who will benefit from nuclear. I'll start and I'll come down this way. So uh, John Wagner, please. There's a lot in that question, Alicia. Um, so let me start on communications. Uh, and, I, and I'll try to be brief, but let me tell you that I've been a nuclear engineer for more than 20 years. And there was a time period when I'd get on an airplane and somebody would say, what do you do for a living? And I'd say, I'm an engineer. It's a missed opportunity. So what I've really been pressing, not just on myself, but on, on my entire 5,400 people that work at the laboratory, is get out in your communities, in your families, uh, wherever you are, and just answer questions. Because a lot of them are not detailed technical questions or, or involve classified information or anything like that. Just answer questions. Don't be an advocate. Don't, don't oversell. Just, just explain. People have questions about safety of, of nuclear systems. They have questions about spent nuclear fuel. They have, they have just questions. And what we found is as we do that and as we bring more and more people to the lab, you're all invited to come visit the laboratory, by the way, but, but also people outside of our, our own kind of community, bring them and show them to the extent we can. What does it look like? And, and just answer the questions. We've been bringing in groups that have not been favorable to nuclear to just try to help them understand what it is the technology is, what we're trying to do with it, and so forth, and try to be a credible source of information. I think that once you have that, people's minds, um, you know, they come along in a, in a very positive way, this, this has been my experience. What is one thing that the governments could do? We have to financially backstop the big, the first big demonstration projects. Um, and uh, there's a lot of legislation, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program in the U.S. is essential, but at the end of the day for these utilities, these are financial decisions, and the first ones that are going are taking the risk. Uh, we've got to financially backstop them um, in a constructive way, understanding the roles of government and private sector. Then the last thing, it's not part of your question, we talk a lot about coal to nuclear conversion. I'm a big supporter. I, I love what's, what's being talked about there and the opportunity that that represents. Um, I just want to throw out the ta on the table, also think about nuclear to nuclear conversion. Those reactor sites where they've shut reactors down or plan to for whatever reasons, most of those sites, they've lost the tax base there. They have workers if they haven't already transitioned to something else. Uh, there is a, and they already have, in most cases, a very favorable community around nuclear. So let's not forget about those and the opportunity that those sites represent. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, John. Um, Congressman Lamb, please, to you. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, giving us your attention here today. I, I would just like to emphasize the role that the military can play in all this. Um, you know, the, I have found that some of the best spokesmen and spokeswomen for the nuclear industry as a whole are uh, retired naval officers who spent their career driving nuclear reactors over the open ocean in very dangerous and difficult conditions. Um, and for six or seven decades now, we've done that with submarines and aircraft carriers and never had a meltdown or a serious incident of any kind because they're very good at the safety and procedures. And I think when people hear that, there's a little bit of a trust factor then. The military is much more trusted in American life than other institutions are. And so um, they're able to be effective spokesmen. And I think it, as far as an action step that I would love to see and, and I'd like to continue to try to push is the military as a whole really needs to reach further into our educational system, especially at the high school level. Uh, we're, we're in a situation now where about uh, three quarters of, of high school uh, children are not eligible to join the military, at least at first glance, because of physical and psychological and educational factors. Uh, we're gonna have a major problem if we don't start to help solve problems like that. So all over the country, there are these JROTC programs and things where the military is trying to build up the next generation of recruits. We should be doing that with the Navy and, and nuclear science as well, getting kids hooked at an early age. And I think the DG could tell you there's, there's a generation of people in Western Pennsylvania who got support in high school from Westinghouse and went into the nuclear industry as a result. I think in modern times it's hard for one company to do something like that, uh, but the military as a whole has the funding and reach to do that. So I'd love to see if we could advance that. Thank you, sir. And Director General Magwood, please. 
Well, thank you, Ms. Duncan, and thank all of you for, for being with us. I see we're getting the rush here, so I won't talk very long, but a, a couple of points. For, first thing I think is important, um, I want to I want to resonate with um, with uh, with Professor Allen's comments about, particularly about um, our mutual friend Professor uh, Aditi Verma's uh, paper. Um, nuclear grew up in isolation of society. Um, nuclear has progressed as part of society, and we have to, we have to as a community as a sector figure out how best to do that. And one aspect of that, which I know is close to Ms. Duncan's heart is that we do have to fix the gender gap in the nuclear sector. Uh, when you look at polling across the world, the most skeptical part of almost every population about nuclear is female. Um, women in countries around the world don't trust the nuclear sector. And I can't help but think that a big part of that is because when I see people talking about nuclear, it's always the usual guys in suits who are all engineers, and it is, we're not talking their language. I think we have to fix that gender gap. Um, the one action item I would take, I would, I would really plead governments to do, is to um, inject truth and reality about all technologies, but particularly nuclear technology, into their education systems. Um, kids are being misinformed across the world about nuclear science and technology. And it is a crime, in my view. And that's something that governments could take an action to fix. So that would be the one thing I would fix. Thank you. Um, and because I do see people gathering at the door, I just, um, if you would, Dr. Allen, just give me your one action step. OK, so as the retired Navy nuclear captain on the panel, uh, I would say use local community speakers and use young people, right? They are going to be way more impressed with somebody who says, I'm dedicating the next 40 years of my life to this. And they are going to listening to an old dude like me. Thank you so much. And <laughs> please give us the last word. So in terms of the regulation, obviously we need a common framework uh, to the licensing of the new technologies and to speed up the deployment efforts. And in this regard, Romania is working with the EU and the EU SMR um, a partnership. So I think here that cooperation could strengthen the deployment and make it faster. And just in terms of the cooperation, yes, uh, nuclear it is safe, as nuclear it's a, it's a great contributor to a cleaner energy. And that's science, not politics. And I think that's the message we need to get out, that a lot of those conclusions and lessons are based on science. And as I said at the beginning, we really need to make efforts in getting the nuclear away as uh, not being anymore the bow bow in the room that we are all scared about it. Yes, you could have worries about, you know, uh, uh, safetyness, but those worries will be eliminated through a fair, honest dialogue, just proving the facts, as I said earlier, that the science shows that you are safe, you are creating jobs, you are contributing to the mixed energy of your country that is securing your energy independence, and it's just a very good, sustainable way of source of energy. Thank you. Thank you. And thank and you, Alicia, for everything. Thank you. And thank our panelists all. Thank you so much. <laughs>